Hello everybody and thanks for watching. In today's video we're going to review the Synology DS224 Plus. This is Synology's new full featured entry level 2-bay NAS. I'll go through the hardware, the software, setting up the drives, and do some preliminary testing on this new NAS unit. Stick around for the rest of the video and as always don't forget to subscribe and hit that like button if you find this useful. Full disclosure, Synology did send me the NAS and the NAS drives to make this video, but they didn't pay or influence me in any way. And I did want to offer a special thanks to the team at Synology for providing me this hardware for this review. If you've seen any of my videos, you know that despite having numerous Synology units at, at work, I've been mainly a QNAP and Unraid user at home. This was largely driven by cost of the hardware as well as video transcoding performance, which are often important in home applications. With this device, Synology intends to address these challenges head on for both the home user and small business. So let's go through the hardware, the specs, the configuration, and do some preliminary testing. I'll be doing some additional videos on more application specific uses, so make sure you get subscribed and check back for new content. In the box, you get external power supply, two ethernet cables, screws, in the event that you want to use a two and a half inch drive, a quick start guide, and of course the NAS itself. Looking at the back of the device, you get two one gig LAN ports, a USB 3.2, the power connector, and at the top is the 92 millimeter fan that's used for cooling the hard drives. Going to the front of the unit is a status light, LAN 1, LAN 2, disc 1, and disc 2 LEDs, and before that is another USB 3.2 port, followed by the copy button and the power button. Pulling the faceplate off exposes the drives. To release the drive tray, just push on the tab and it slides the tray out. The drive trays are toolless for three and a half inch drives and have screw holes for mounting two and a half inch drives or SSDs. If you pull both the drive trays out, we expose the memory slot where we can expand the included two gigs of RAM to six gigs by adding one DDR memory module. I'll be expanding this to six gigs for a future video when I test out Plex as a media server. To install the drive trays is very straightforward. Just pop out the plastic clips on the side and insert your drives being careful to line up the holes and just carefully push the clips back in and you're ready to insert it into the NAS. Put both drives back in, replace the front plate and power it up. Make sure you plug it in one of the LAN ports of your switch or router so it can be detected during configuration. Give it a few minutes to start the boot process and then open your browser and type finds.synology.com. It'll search your network for a device and prompt you when it finds it. Assuming it located your device, take note of the IP address so that you can easily access it in the future. Click on connect and accept the EULA and select next. After the privacy statement, you're greeted with the setup screen. So select install to continue. Leave the default auto download and install the latest DSM. Next, you'll be warned about deleting data, but as this is a new install and we're creating the configuration for the first time, we can just click on confirmation and click on. From here, we'll go through most of the process automatically. I'll move ahead to the start screen so we don't have to watch all this. When you get to the start screen, select start and enter a device name and create an admin account. As this is a test unit, I'll keep the credentials simple, but I would recommend making a complex password. Hit next when you're done. Here you're given a choice to install only important DSM and package updates or install all updates and DSM releases. I usually like to install everything, but for this video we'll leave the default and only opt for the important updates. Next you're prompted with creating a Synology account. This offers you a lot of functionality such as a secure sign-in, access to your NAS remotely, and many other features. You'll have to decide what you're comfortable with based on your particular situation. Synology does a great job with the security of their accounts, and if you want the functionality, then you can go ahead. However, in my case, I use TailScale and prefer to minimize my threat surface and have only a, as few accounts as possible. So for this video, I'll skip it. Optionally, you can decide to send device analytics and hit submit or leave it unchecked. You can choose to install some of their recommended apps, or you can skip it as you can always install it later. Nothing wrong with doing it at this time, but my preference is always to add one thing at a time so I can understand what it's doing. So I'll skip over this for now. We'll get back to it when I need it later. As this is a test unit, I'll skip the extended warranty and the same will apply for the two-factor authentication. 
though I highly recommend you enable two-factor authentication, and I typically use it on everything that supports it. This next part is important, as we're going to create a storage pool and volume. If you're not familiar with this process, a pool is an aggregation of one or more drives into one pool. In other words, in this installation, we'll have two drives, but they'll be combined to form one pool. Let's go ahead and hit start, and the first screen that you're being asked about is what type of RAID you want to use. Let's talk a bit about what you want to use for this. The default for Synology is their hybrid RAID, which has some real advantages in certain cases. One of the main advantages is that you don't have to have the same size drives. And secondly, depending on your configuration, you may save on storage capacity and not waste storage. The downside can be performance. In this two drive unit, there won't be any performance difference between using the hybrid RAID or RAID 1. Both will have fault tolerance. However, if you have three or more drives and you're running a 10 gig network, you may want to consider something different like RAID 5 to maximize performance. To verify that this won't have any adverse effect on performance, I did a quick speed test for both the hybrid RAID and a RAID 1 configuration. And as you can see, they're pretty much identical in speed as the only limitation comes from the network connection and not from the RAID configuration or the drives themselves. If you're only using a one gig networking, hybrid RAID should be fine for most applications. So we'll go ahead and select SHR or the hybrid RAID and hit next. Here we'll select both drives to be part of the pool and select next. We can skip the drive check as these are new drives and on the next screen, we need to set the size of the volume of this pool and optionally give it a description. One thing to consider with this is how you want to use the device. For example, I might want to create two volumes on this. One say at 2500 gigabytes for general purpose storage apps and operating system and the remaining 1215 I'll leave unused and create a second volume that I can encrypt. If there's any interest in knowing how to do this, then leave a comment below. In most cases, or if you're not sure, just use the max button and allocate the entire capacity to the volume. In the next screen, again, we'll pick the default. On this screen, you have to choose whether or not you want to encrypt the entire volume. And as we discussed earlier, we'll leave it un unencrypted. Though this is somewhat subjective, I typically do not encrypt the entire volume unless a second volume dedicated for the purpose of encrypted data will be created. And I don't like encrypting a single volume. You can still encrypt shared folders at a later time. And we'll talk about that a little later in the video. Keep that in mind when you create your volumes. If you'd like to know more information about this, let me know in the comments and I'll create a separate video that discusses this particular configuration. Next is the summary as well as a warning that your data will be erased. When it's done, you'll end up with the storage manager with an overview of your storage. Going back to the main screen, let's click on the control panel and complete our setup with the shared folder. This is where we'll create our first shared folder. The first screen is straightforward. You just give the share a name, a description, and decide if you want to use the recycle bin. If you want to hide the share from appearing when you browse or when your users browse, then click on hide my in my network places. But most of the time, this will be left unchecked. The next step is the option to encrypt that folder. You have two options here, the traditional encryption and the write once encryption, which allows the data to be written once, read as many times as you want. This adds an extra layer of protection for overwrites and accidental deletions. I would experiment with test folders when using encryption before encrypting an existing folder. For this video, we won't do any encryption and we'll just accept the defaults. Under permissions, if you have any users, you can assign rights to each user. Now I want to quickly cover some of the key sections that you may want to review and get familiar with. The next section is file services. The SMB service is enabled by default, but if it's not, you can enable it here. This is what your systems will use for file sharing, so it has to be turned on. Depending on your network, you may have to change your work group, but in the majority of cases, you can just accept the default. I won't cover every option as the defaults work in most cases, but feel free to reach out in the comments if you have any questions. Next is the users and users groups. Here you can create additional users to restrict access to certain things or to provide a private folder for each user. You also have the option to create different groups and assign users to it. This is really useful when you have multiple people that need to access the same things. As when you assign permissions to a group, it affects the entire group, making it easier to customize things and add more people. If you didn't create a Synology account in the original setup and change your mind, you can do it right here in this tab. 
Under Network, you can change the name of your device as well as customize your networking. I won't go into the detail in this video, but just know it's there. And again, if you have any questions, just post them in the comments. In the Security tab, the defaults are pretty well configured, and there are many advanced features here that we won't cover in this video. In the Info Center, you have a summary of your device, networking, and your storage. Under the Login Portal, you can add a login page title, your own background, and add a logo. Below that are regional options, such as time and date formats and time zones. Next is the Notification Center, and below that is the hardware settings, including where you set up your UPS settings if it's attached to a UPS, which I would highly recommend doing. Under Update and Restore, you can change your update settings, and under the Configuration and Backup, you can set up your automatic backup. Keep in mind that you have to have a Synology account and it has to be logged in for this feature to work. There are many settings, I won't go through everything, as this was just a quick overview for the initial setup and configuration. Let me know if there's any sections you'd like to dig deeper into and what you'd like to see. In summary, this is a two drive unit that's ideal device for anyone who has a small to moderate storage need and wants a powerful NAS that can handle media transcoding with overall great performance. There aren't many competitors in this category that have a quad core four thread CPU that supports quick sync for video transcoding. For all but the simplest use cases, you'll have to upgrade the RAM, but the upgrade stick to take me to six gig cost me less than 20 bucks. One of the things that stands out for me after setting up many of the competitors units is that the Synology default settings are exactly what I would set up and they don't randomly enable stuff that you don't need or that might jeopardize your, the security of your device. I ended up liking this better than I thought I would, and I plan on making a few more videos on things like Plex or Tailscale and possibly MB. Thanks again to the Synology team for supplying the hardware, and don't forget to like and subscribe if you found this useful. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you on the next video.